Extras. What makes an artifact? A common trope in Dungeons and Dragons is the idea, vague in some editions, clearly delineated in others, that artifacts are a separate class of magic items, powerful, legendary, nigh indestructible. My guess is it harkens back to the Rings of Power in Lord of the Rings, which were themselves Tolkien's take on mythical items from various cultures and ancient literature. But D&D's roots really start in Tolkien's version of the lore. So the term artifact brings to mind a magic item that is powerful, maybe seductive, something to be kept secret and very difficult to unmake. I'm guessing a lot of us don't think much about it, but what is the distinction between an ordinary magic item, for example a plus six stat item made by a player with the item crafting rules, or those ersatz plus one swords everyone has picked up by the time they hit fifth level, what's the difference between those and an artifact? Fizwell actually alludes to it early in the episode, describing the amulet known as the Colana Dialia. He doesn't just say, it's from a god, and leave it at that, though of course he could. But he describes the accumulation of love and sorrow, history and destiny, the forces which can transform a mere piece of equipment, over time, into something more. Now, some people do set out to deliberately create an artifact, for good reasons or bad reasons, and some of them succeed. But you can't just sink a bunch of ordinary resources and cash into crafting to forge a mighty, nigh-indestructible power. There may be shortcuts to imbue such magic without the passage of time, but it would require great purpose, great skill and knowledge, and great sacrifice. If, then, these are the elements which can transform mere mortal handiwork into a power that might one day shape the world, the amulet worn by King Kelvoras and lost in the Shatter War would certainly qualify. At least a couple of you may have noticed a fact or two which didn't quite sound right, the Kalana Dialia is frequently referred to as the amulet given to King Kelvoras by his mistress, the goddess Dialia. But Thiswell suggested in passing that it was a result of the Eladrin craftspeople of legend. As with every other part of the story, things are a little more complicated. The amulet in question was actually crafted by King Kelvoras himself assisted by a number of his finest artisans, jewelers, and wizards, all working together to try and create a bauble worthy to hang from the neck of the goddess of love, and emblazoned with her symbol in filigree. However, when the king presented Dialia the amulet, she told him that she could not wear such a gift, for she goes where she will in the world, often transforms into a tree or an animal, and prowling the jungle as a panther, or springing across the plains as a gazelle, as a beast she would soon forget such a thing and lose it in the wilds. Unspoken was that Dialia is a goddess, and more than that, goddess of love, primal and unbound by the ties most mortals lay upon themselves and upon each other. And neither she, nor any other god, can be pinned down or branded or possessed by any mortal. Kilvoras was understandably devastated as she handed back his gift, but she pulled a strand of her own divine hair, stronger than mithril, glowing with a green sheen in the sunlight. She strung it through the amulet and bade him wear it himself, with her hair as a token of her love. Which you'd think would be a little awkward around his wife, but this is mythological stuff. You can't always take events that happened at the dawn of the world by modern Vistrian standards. As explained, I made some major changes to the plane shift spell to deal with our setting's planar cosmology. First off, when going with so few planes accessible to mortals, I love the idea that they are a mirror of one another, and therefore locations map to each other one to one with rare exceptions. Not only does this give a very hands-on feel to the planes, knowing that if you travel 50 miles west in the Fadelands, then somehow transit to the Feywild, you have moved the same 50 miles west in the Feywild as well. If you pick a mountain or a sea coast as a landmark as you travel, then when you travel to the other side, you will find a similar shaped mountain or sea coast in the same place. 
In fact, theoretically, if you knew the right portals, you could bypass a threat or obstacle on one plane by shifting to another plane, traveling there, then shifting back to the first plane. And there was great synergy in the fact that by removing the obnoxious 5D 100 mile inaccuracy from the spell, look it up, so that in this version you don't move at all in the three spatial dimensions, that made it logical that this spell could get away without the Eldritch Eye cost associated with teleporting in our world. Along this vein, I also liked the idea that plane shifting would become sort of an expedition where you go there for some goal, or just to explore, and then have to come back to your entry point several days later. So my version of plane shift, which ended up having way too many rules, it opens a portal which you and your allies can pass through. Once you pass through, the portal closes on both sides, and on the destination side, the portal remains for up to a week in a form which is invisible to anyone except the group who passed through it, to whom it appears transparent. One interesting aspect is that any member of that group, not just the caster, can reopen the portal for the return trip, simply by touching it and concentrating for a moment. This is great because it means if the caster dies you aren't stuck. However, once it is reopened, the portal only lasts for a minute before the spell ends. Not only does this mean that you have to be very careful who you travel with, since one coward or traitor could double back and abandon you in an alien territory, but because it opens for a minute, or until the maximum number of creatures have passed through, once it is opened, other creatures could potentially sneak or force their way through it, potentially invading your home world. Also, I said the portal is invisible. But that means it sticks out like a sore thumb to those, admittedly rare, creatures who can see the invisible. They can't open it, but they can sure as hell camp out there and wait for you to come back. Now, as I mentioned, my version was up to its encumbrance in rules. When you cast it, you don't get the spell slot back until the spell ends, so if you stay in the other plane for more than a day, you'll be operating with one less 5th level spell, or 7th level for arcane casters. And there were rules for planar sickness that hits you when the week is up, if you have not returned through the portal. Like, it can mess you up in a manner which is certainly not permanent, but which could certainly get you killed if you were already in a bad situation. In hindsight, what I should have done was more simply say that if you travel through a plane shift portal, you can't use any other portal from a plane shift spell for one week. Because the purpose of all the rules in Junk was that when you use this powerful spell to breach the planar boundaries, you either come back through your own portal as planned, or you have to survive a whole week before you can cast it again. That's the way I wanted to raise the stakes a little. You could also get back if you discovered a natural portal, but those are not all that common. Of course, the standout character in this episode is the Feywild itself. Only one tiny corner of one continent of the plain, mind you. One little wooded area in the wilderness, not near any major settlements that they know of. Maybe someday they'll get to a more civilized area of the plain, like the Eladrin lands, or find one of the rare and hidden villages of the gnomes. But I put a lot of effort into presenting some visuals to show that, yes, this is a different place. I feel like the time constraints and pacing for the video caused the examples of different animals in the plane to be compressed into a rapid-fire, in-your-face, look-how-different-we-are pile-up, which was present to some extent in the game itself, but I feel like the better pacing made it more natural and less of a montage. And for the record, Little One made a good call. The Invisible Panther was not some polymorphed spellcaster or anything. It was an animal an invisible predator, which makes it pretty high on the food chain. And, like many animals in the Feywild, it has a higher intelligence score than most normal world equivalents. But it had no agenda and no desire to attack a half-dozen strange bipeds traveling in a group. I do like to imagine the consequences of the evolutionary arms race between predators and prey with spell-like and supernatural abilities thrown into the mix. Is there some kind of cost to evolving mere image? Does licking a frog clops give you true seeing? And, if that true seeing only lasts while your tongue is actually touching the frog, would some kind of larger animal form a symbiotic relationship? 
each of them lugging around a frog clops on their back or in a pouch or inside their mouth. Obviously, as a player character, you'd still feed it and haul it around in your pack, but how often would you actually lick the frog? I'm not saying it actually does that. It's just a thought experiment. For what it's worth, those skinny blue trees, many of them 300 to 450 feet tall, their trunks look much thicker than they should in the video. With most of them being only 6 to 8 inches thick, at a distance it would look like almost nothing relative to their gigantic height. Begging, of course, the question, why? You don't see it as much in my art, because it would have been a pain, but there is a ton of underbrush, two to three layers of flora, even beneath these immense trees. Their huge but sparse leaves let enough sun filter down to keep it all going, but that's because the trees are only relying partially on photosynthesis for their energy. During the day, they take in a little sun to keep them going, but their primary nourishment is the ambient magic of the plain. The leaves are supported partially by the magic they soak in, magical energy which is distributed throughout the volume of the plain. The shape of the leaves evolved to be wide enough for that subtle magical counterpressure to balance out the force of gravity while growing as long as possible straight out from the tree, and as they reach out to get it energy further from the trunk, the leaves grow fairly far apart, trying to maximize each leaf's reach without too much overlap, and incidentally allowing more sun through to the plants closer to the ground. And if you're wondering, yes, Graven took a sample of one of those leaves. Of course, then we come to what they fought amidst the blue trees of the Nilly Woods. Considering they are large creatures, even the minions, the throng of briar vex just popping out was pretty comical in the episode, as though they were hiding behind the twig-like trees, but as I mentioned above, there's actually tons of underbrush, very thick in certain places, and the briar vex have quite a good hide check lying low in such plant-filled surroundings. But the real problem was, of course, Menyareth, that troublemaking fey archer. Clearly, he had a bit of a mood swing thing going on, not to mention more than a little bit of dialogue patterned after the Nolan Ledger joke. He had nothing to do with the problem being caused by the artifact they sought, nor did he have anything to really gain from it, but he wedged himself into the situation as a malicious trickster. The funny thing is, I had designed his stats starting from some kind of four-armed archer from a monster manual. But I haven't been able to find it since then, so I can't even tell you what his name was. But I was looking for something interesting that could be made into a type of actual fey creature, not just native to the fey wild, but a genuine fairy folk type. When I saw the double archer, whatever it was, it occurred to me that I could use similar stats and challenge rating for a regular two-armed archer who was twice as fast. Or what if the guy and his shadow both shoot? And as so often happens when you start working on an idea, a whole bunch of things came together, like that villain from the Chronicles of Riddick, the leader of the Necromongers, who had a shadowy version of himself, tethered to him, but able to move around independently. He appeared invincible, because if you stabbed at his body, it would instantly leap to the shadow. The way I worked in this defense made it very, very powerful. You effectively have to cover both the body and the shadow, and even then it's as good as a displacement spell. But to compensate, I increased his CR and also cut back his hit points quite a lot, which means that when Draven finally hit him, that orb of force did a huge chunk of his hit points and damage. But anyway, back to the creation process. I then started thinking about what his role could be in the Fey community. The name Batine, as far as I can tell, I pulled it out of my ass, along with the concept. I'm pretty sure it's a word I made up to not sound like any major pre-existing monster, but to sound like a proper name, rather than a descriptive name like Lizardmen or Redcats. It's not based on any real-world mythology that I can find, but my double archer, with his animate shadow, just screamed dual nature, so it seemed natural in that twisted face sense that his kind might be a bridge between, or double agent within, the world of the Fey a member of both the Seely and Unseely courts, the so-called good and bad fair folk. Why would they ever trust such an individual? They probably don't, 
but like all true fay the Batine would be bound by their word so the most powerful among both groups of fay would not fear to deal with them most fay but especially the nobles of their kind are extremely wise and wary wordsmiths and bargain makers who would unravel the most complex of our mortal legal contracts as effortlessly as you might unravel your own shoelaces fay have some other weird properties that we have yet to get into as far as menureth's double-sided drama mask which many people commented on i have to confess i came up with that later when trying to illustrate him for the episode with time so compressed compared to the actual game sessions i'm almost on the lookout for ways to express things visually and rereading the lines that i had written for him way back when i planned the adventure i found he really was trying to play both good cop and bad cop all on his own and the mask seemed like a clever way to emphasize that quality especially since i wasn't sure how well i would be able to show off his shadow tricks in animation i was very happy with the way he came out and i was glad to see a number of people comment about it so i hope you aren't disappointed that the mask wasn't part of the original player's experience in hindsight though you may notice i never did mention it in the script Altogether, though, he was a member of a species of fae not based on any known mythology, with stats based on a monster I can't even find anymore. Clothing is custom, no labels. What do we got? Nothing. Like this joker just came out of nowhere. Don't forget to like these videos, and if you want to listen to more of me, you can always follow me on Twitter at TalesDDC, on Facebook I'm DemonacAGC, and on demonact.tumblr.com.